Hi everyone, it's Ben from Degita Fabrique. Um, I'm the creative producer here on Salty Chronicles, and I'm joined by Daria and Doug. Do you guys want to quickly introduce yourselves? Uh, you first, Daria. Um, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Daria, and I am lead programmer on Spoils, our in-house card game. And I did a lot of the work on the infrastructure of the card game and also on the AI that powers the players. So I hope that you will find it enjoyable. Yeah, uh, hi everybody. I'm uh, Doug. Uh, I am uh, one of the designers on Salt Seas Chronicles uh, and especially on this in-game card game called Spoils that we're, that we're gonna show in this video. Um, so, uh, why are, why are we here? What, what are we doing? Uh, yeah, so we wanted to get together to, um, first of all, show a little bit more of, um, spoils, um, because we've, we've sort of talked about it, but not shown much of it. Um, and secondly, uh, talk about it as creators, sort of give a little bit of insight into, making it and the decisions and um so it's going to be sort of multi-purpose really um hopefully people will have a good sense of what the game is and how to play it um and what it's about um, but also what it took to bring it to fruition yeah and a lot obviously a lot of people worked on this if you think about the ui and the illustrations and the writing and the audio and so you know we can kind of shout out lots of people that were involved in this I would say the three of us, though, were kind of maybe the main people or like the leaders of this part of the game, right? So Salt Sea Chronicles is this bigger narrative video game uh, where you're exploring these islands, you're reading a lot of conversations, choosing uh, kind of which characters to take um, and, and where to sail to. But on each island in each chapter of this game, you can go off and play this card game, which we're about to show. Um, and I know the, the three of us uh, had a lot of meetings about this, designing the game, um, Daria, in your case, implementing the game. So um, maybe, maybe we should just dive in and start explaining what this is. Yeah, let's let's go for it. Uh, okay. What, why don't we start with the kind of like most basic version of this card game, um, and then we can kind of add more and more rules, get to the more advanced versions as we go. So we're here in chapter one of this um Narr narrative adventure game, Salty Chronicles, uh, on an uh, island called Nyarfi Roust. Um, and uh, so in this chapter, in this pub called the Weathered Wing, one of these uh, kind of actions you can take is go to this table where these NPCs are playing this card game. So let's let's do this, because in this chapter, we give you the most basic version of, of this card game. The card game is called Spoils. It is a trick-taking game, uh, which is a very famous kind of well-known genre trick take of, of card games if you've ever heard of 500 or bridge or hearts or spades these are all um, games that use this mechanic of uh, what's called the trick so we can show this so we get into this conversation um, with NPCs here we have this character Merle who's leading uh, the expedition um, as these two characters are kind of searching around this island um, and uh we we brought Stu, the crew uh, cruise cook, with us. Um, so let's um, let's get into the card game real quick. So this is what it looks like on the island. I'm gonna play spoils or not? Yeah, let's play spoils. No, I'm not gonna play tutorial. We'll we'll give the tutorial as we go. So this is a 2v2 card game, kind of like Bridge, kind of like 500. So it's the player character, basically the, the two characters from the, the player's crew, Merle and Stu, versus the two NPCs, the grumpy patron and the barfly. So we're going to uh, sh shuffle the deck and uh, deal out all the cards. Um, yeah, let's get started. So. You opened up the game, um, presenting with the screen. Um, what's your first move? Like, what's the, like, let's talk a little bit about the flow of the game. So, um, 
it's it's our turn first. Um, that that won't always be the case every round. But so we're, we'll we'll lead uh, is the kind of term from trick taking. So we can play any of the cards we want. Um, and so let's just do an example turn. Um, and uh, really quickly, Daria, can I turn this to turn based instead of automatic so I can control the flow? Yes. So that's um, also uh, an interesting feature that we have is that you can have the flow of the game to be automatic so that each player plays the card after a certain amount of time, or you can set it to manual so you can actually wait and look at the cards before you can just click so the next player plays their own card so it's it's this button is that right yes yeah so let me let's let us control because you can have this convenience feature where the, the game will kind of play fast but we, we want to take this slow as we explain it so yeah. um i don't know for just uh examples sake let's play a small card um so let's just play uh I don't know. Let's play the. F uh, we'll see what happens. This may not be the best move, but let's just start with it. the the four of shells. Okay. Um. So let's see. It's going to go around in clockwise order. So the left um, uh, opponent, I believe that's the grumpy patron. Is that right? Yeah. Um, is going to go. So click. Well, okay, importantly. So um... The move that they have to make on their turn has to follow the suit of the, the card that you've you've set as the lead suit. So, um, so, so we're limited to their shells in that in their so, deck. So this this is kind of a, a rule that's true to most trick taking games. So right, a trick means we each it's a turn based game, and all four players at the table will each play one card in, in clockwise order. But uh, whoever plays the first card who starts the trick sets the lead suit. So now you must play the lead suit if you have a card of that lead suit. So because we played the Four of Shells, if you have a shell card, you must play it. Now, if you have multiple shell cards, you can choose which one to play. Some trick-taking games have it that you have to play like um, your highest suit uh, card in the lead suit. That's, that's not true in, sp in spoils. Uh, you just have to play any card that you have of the lead suit. We'll get to what happens if you don't have any, in this case, shells. But, okay. So, Grumpy Patron played a king. Um, now, the king is the highest ranking card, right? It's kind of like uh, the hot king is like the highest card in, in the suit. So, it's currently winning the trick. That's why it has the little crown above it. Um, uh, and, in fact, there, no other shell can possibly be higher, than a shell. So the grumpy patron is probably going to win this trick uh, unless something strange happens, and we'll see that in a second. So, uh, yeah. Um, just to like explain the sort of what you're seeing on the screen, the crown um, over a played card means that that card is the currently winning card. Um, so the person who dealt it is is currently in line to win the win the trick. And. Note, we'll get to this in a second. The points aren't necessarily mapped how you might think they are to the rank of the card, right? So the king is worth zero points. The four is worth four points. The three is worth three points. But if you look at this mapping on the right side, actually the jack is worth 11 points. But then there's like some cards that are worth no points, like the five, six, and seven are all worth zero points. So we'll get to this in a second. This is going to get... Um, we're we're about to get to the kind of like the core mechanic that kind of makes this game weird. So let's play. Let's the uh, uh, last turn. Bar five plays a two. Okay, so we've all we've played the trick. We've all played a card. Um, Grumpy Patron is going to win this. They have the highest ranking card. Uh, it, it, to be honest, this is like kind of bad for us so far. We'll see what happens. So um, see what happens here. Now this is where this game gets weird. We just saw the core mechanic of this game. Um, in a lot of trick-taking games, like, let's think about hearts, the person who wins the trick takes all the cards and might score all the points. Not true in spoils. Uh, in spoils, the card that won the trick, so in this case, the king of shells, goes to the other team. Um, and now we'll see. So we got the king. Unfortunately, it was worth zero points. And now the the 
team that won the trick, uh, the Grumpy Patron and the Barfly, are going to get the other three cards. And those are going to be four plus three plus two points, nine points. The way that you can win spoils is if you have the most points at the end of the round. So the idea is that you need, you want to gather as many points. So it doesn't matter how many tricks you actually win or how you win them, but it's the amount of points that you have at the end that matters. Right. So in a lot of trick taking games, it might be the number of tricks you win and that individual yeah. cards aren't worth individual points. But, but this is a game where we don't score the number of rounds you won, we score the individual cards, complicated by the fact that you're always giving the winning card away to the other team. So uh, winning with the king and the queen is kind of safe, right? Because they're both wi worth zero points. Um, but things are going to get dangerous because if we win the trick with a jack, for example, you now give the jack away as a, if it, if that's the highest card that wins the trick, you're giving 11 points away to the other team. So we'll, we'll see. This is where there's going to, um, some strategy is going to come into it. Okay. So we played a trick. Let's play the next trick. Uh, whoever won the last trick leads the next trick. So grumpy patrons going to get to start. They get to play whatever card they want. Okay. So they started with a king, a fish. Um, and so no one's going to be able to beat the king of fish. We'll, we'll talk more about that later, right? But the king is the highest ranked card in the suit of fishes. Those of us who have fishes must play a fish card we have. So let's see what our partner plays. Oh boy, that's really bad. Our partner just played the ace of fish. It's like worth 10 points uh, that we know the other team's gonna get. So uh, maybe maybe that was Stu's last fish card. Maybe they were forced to play that card, but it's not, not great for us. Um, Okay, um, an NPC played uh, Queen of Fish. So, in these four fish cards, uh, I reckon we probably should play the seven, right? Because we want to give the fewest number of points to the other team, right? Like, all the other cards are worth two, four, or two points. We know we're going to lose this. Um, I get it, okay. And right, like the, the NPCs will sometimes have what we call barks, right? They have these little uh, comments that they're making about the game. So they're, they're very impatient with us. I get it. We're, yeah, but we're, we're we're taking our time. Um, so let's let's play seven. Okay, so the winning card goes to us. Big whoop. It's worth zero points. And then here's a little painful. They get the rest of the points, including uh, the ten that Stu gave. Okay, so uh, we're gonna start the third trick. Hmm. Yeah, sometimes you you're the last card to play, and you know that you're going to lose the trick and your job yep. is to just sort of minimize the damage of how many points you give away yep. cool. so uh, boy the grumpy patron started with strong cards so it's really kind of dictating the flow of play here uh, it starts with the king of anchors so if you have an anchor you must play it do plays the four of anchors Ugh, not great for us it's so four great. points we're bleeding points here oh boy uh <laughs> Ace of Anchor. We are getting... It's not over, but it's not a strong start for us. Um, um, and this is an example, right, of kind of teamwork. So the lead suit plays a high card, and now their partner can kind of what's called feed them, right, like a low card, because they know that uh, unless something weird happens here, we're, we're going to talk... We're going to see that probably in a few tricks. Um, probably the king of anchors is going to win this. So we... Uh, must play an anchor. We have two choices. Uh, almost certainly we want to play the two, right? It's going to give them two points. That's probably better than giving them 11 points, necessarily. All right, so let's let's cool. play the two. Okay, we get the, the, the king worthless to us, and they're going to get 16 points. Yikes. Okay, um, once again, the grumpy patron leads the trick. And we'll see if we can kind of break their we're, we're down uh, oh, no. zero to thirty-five uh, this round, but I have faith in, in the comeback. So there, are, there are hundred twenty. If you do the math, there are one hundred twenty-eight points at stake. Um, yeah. So whatever, there's one hundred twenty-eight minus thirty-five points up for grabs still. So let's see what happens. Um, what just happened? Um, <laughs> now I'm I'm not sure Stu played this well, but we can uh, uh, our, and we can talk about. Um, yeah. 
the, the, the AI control of this later. We'll, we'll get to that. But um, let, let, we're just going through the rules first. Um, so, uh, Ben or Daria, do you want to... What, what just happened there? What, what, they, they didn't yeah, play so anchors. Do you're, you're generally not allowed to do this. Generally, you have to... If the lead suit has been set as anchors, you have to choose an anchor from your hand and play that. Stu, it looks like, doesn't have any anchors left. And so in that um, circumstance, you're allowed to play anything from the rest of your hand. Um, it won't win unless, well, we'll get into a circumstance where that's actually good for you to be able to play out of the lead suit. Mm. But um, even though Stu's put down a king because it's not in the lead suit, it's not valid as a winning card. It's just sort of putting it down for the sake of having to put something down. Um, but at the very least, Stu is not feeding any points to the uh, other team. Yeah. With that, with that uh, play. Look, I, I'm going to be honest. I think this is a terrible play from Stu. Uh, you know, far be it from me to question the ma machine learning algorithm behind it. But we'll, we'll talk about that later. But I, I wonder about this play. We, we can talk about that. But you'll note the crown is above the queen. But isn't a like like Ben was just saying, isn't a king a higher ranking card than a queen? Well, it is. But anything that's not in the lead suit is lower than any card in the lead suit. Uh, well, with one exception, we'll get to that in a bit. But right. So even um, the two, if 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 the grumpy patron had played the two of anchors, very low anchor card, that would still be a higher card than a king not in the lead suit. Okay. Um, now, the exemption is what uh, we call the sweeper suit. And a lot of trick-taking games is called a trump suit. Um, so at the beginning of this game was randomly picked one of the four suits to be the special sweeper suit. And that is in fact fish. And what that means is fish are necessarily better than any suit in the game. So any fish, even a low ranking fish, wins over any other card of any other suit. So Stu, maybe Stu doesn't have any fish, but if Stu had any fish, they could have played a fish, what's called breaking the lead suit, and they would now have the highest card. So a couple questions here. Why didn't Stu play a fish? Maybe they don't have one, I don't know. Uh, and oh, why did they play a king? Like, I guess it's worth zero points, but you know, possibly, Stu could have led with the king later to kind of win a, a star's trick. So it's a little bit weird play, but uh, we'll talk more about the AI later. Um, but still, even though Stu has broken the lead suit, uh, the barfly and us, Merle, the, uh, the character on the bottom who we're controlling, we we still must play the lead suit. We must play anchors if we have one. So okay, the barfly played a three. This is not um, good for us. Not good for us. We only have yeah. one choice. We we must play an anchor if we have one. We do have one. We only have one. You can see all the other cards are grayed out. They are not they are not legal options for us. Right. So um this is bad. We have to play our jack, which is worth eleven points that will go to the other team. So oh if Stu had a fish, this would have been great because we then could have fed the eleven points to Stu. So may maybe Stu's just like a little rusty at spoils or something. So let's anyway, so we get the queen, it's worth zero points, and they're gonna get 14 points. Um boy. Alright, so Grumpy Patron starts again. But now crucially, right, if we we if we're playing this game, the other players, we all know now that Stu doesn't have any anchors. So we're learning more and more information about kind of what cards each player has as each trick elapses. Right? We we also know that we don't have any more anchors. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay, so I think we're gonna finally have a new winner of the trick to lead the next suit. So the grumpy patron plays a seven of shells. Um, Stu plays the ace. Okay, finally, oh. it's going our way. We only have one choice. But it is the highest shell in the trick. Everyone played in the lead suit. Um, yep, uh, you learn by doing. Good, good advice from Stu. So uh, we have the highest ranking card of the lead suit. Nobody played a uh, sweeper uh, suited card of fish. So we're going to win the trick. We give them zero points. And finally, we're on the board. We get 10 plus 2. We get 12 points. Now Hopefully we this lead. Is when the comeback starts. 
This is when the comeback starts. So we lead the next trick because we won the last trick. We get a little bit of control back in the game. Um, now, it, this is a game that benefits from having a good memory, right? So we could lead Fish, which is the sweeper suit. We could lead um, Stars. Um, and if we can remember what cards have already been played from those suits. So for example, we know that Stu already played the King of Stars, which we thought was questionable, but it happened, right? And that means the Queen of Stars is now the next is currently the the highest ranking star left in the game. Let's let's play that and hopefully everyone has a star so that we can win this trick. Yes, but it's worth zero points. With zero. Great. No, the alley oop. Uh so Right, it, 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 we we serve up this winning card, and Stu feeds us this big pointed card. That's great. So let's see. Hopefully, the barfly won't kind of uh, ruin ruin what we got going on. No, great. So we get another twelve points. So uh... catching up a little bit. Uh, we lead the trick again. Yeah. Now it's getting dicey because we have quite low cards um i think the best we can hope for is like hoping that Stu can win a trick or something right um uh, i'm tempted to play all of our cards that we have left up point giving cards as well and yeah. three of them are in the sweeper suit right yes which are I, and we're very likely to win. So I, I, I think in general we want to save our trump cards. Our, what, what we, what spo in spoils we call these sweeper cards. So I, okay, yeah. why don't we play a low pointed star? Is everyone okay with that? Yeah, I think it would be a good idea to try and give the lead to someone else. Yeah. So let's see. Ooh, uh, they don't have any stars, but they didn't break in with the sweeper so we're mm -hmm. still winning the trick right the three is lower than a six but a six is neither a fish it's not the sweeper suit nor is the lead suit so no matter what any anchor is going to be lower than our lead three of, of stars okay Stu plays a five Ooh, not very high so then the barfly plays no wow neither oh, of them okay. had stars very interesting so somehow we win this trick which is wild we give the three um right, we give the five to the other team the winning card it's not worth any points who cares we score the all the other cards two of them are worth zero so we only get three points there okay uh Stu's gonna lead the next trick i know the feeling Stu. i can relate um okay it is interesting because we know neither of our opponents have stars however if I can make a prediction, I bet one of them's gonna break in here with a sweeper suit card, uh, and we, uh, so let's let's see if that happens. No, interesting. So we have no choice; we have to play the four, right? Because I can uh, kind of chime in a bit on the strategy based on memory. So okay. I I remember that quite early in the game, uh, the grumpy patron uh, played um, a K of fish which actually took a lot of fish out of the game already. So it might be that we are the only, uh, that Moral is the only player with fish cards. Or Ooh, that... that would be huge. Uh, <laughs> well, okay, let's, let's see what happens. So, okay, and here's here's the big question. Does does the grumpy patron have a fish? Yeah. Oh, they do. Interesting. So this, I, I thought this would happen. So what just happened? Okay, so the lead, the lead suit, was a star. So you gotta play a star if you have it. Um, the barfly didn't have one. They, they played a card of another suit, loses no matter what. We had to play a star, but then uh, the grumpy patron didn't have the lead suit. They could play whatever they want. They have a sweeper suit. So any fish is gonna beat any of these other three cards on the table because at the start of the game, we randomly decided that fish was the sweeper suit. So unfortunately, we're going to get their Worthless 5, the card that won the trick. And they're going to score all the other cards at 6 points. Okay. And uh, once again, the Grumpy Patron has retaken the lead. 
Very interesting. Oh, interesting. Okay, so, so we, now we might actually kind of see this core mechanic of spoils play out in, in an interesting way. Okay, so we got the, 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 the sweeper suit. So fish will, will beat any other card of any other suit. You must play a fish if you have one. Oh boy. Uh, Merle's, uh, sorry, not Merle's. Uh, our our yeah. partner Stu is really killing us here. We'll, we'll talk about that in a sec. So Stu doesn't have any fish, so I had to play another card. Okay, so this, this is gonna be really interesting. Um, we ha Obviously we only have fish, we have to play a fish. It was the lead suit. It's also our only suit. Nothing we have is higher ranked than a jack. We don't have a queen of fish. We don't have a king of fish. So the jack's going to win. So we pretty much want to minimize the points that we're giving. Both the two and the 10 are worth two points, but a two is a lower ranked card. So let's give them the two. Yeah. Now a lot, of, a lot of points are about to fly around the table. So uh, maybe not a great play from the grumpy patron because the winning card, the jack, actually goes to the other team. Thank you very much. We get 11 points, even though we lost the trick. But then, do what are you doing? Uh, we fed them 11 points plus the, the two that we were forced to play. So they get 13 points. Okay. Um, and Grumpy Patron leads again. Awesome. Lead Maybe they were the one who had the rest of the fish. Yeah. Ah, uh, Stu, you could have played that card last no. turn. Um, okay, anyway, so uh, we can win this with the four, but that would give more points to the other team. Mm -hmm. Or we could win with a 10 to give fewer, but a 10 is higher and is more likely, if we could remember exactly, I have, I, I don't have a photographic memory, so I haven't like written down all the other fish everyone uh, has played. Uh, why don't we just go for giving them fewer points, I think? Do, do the two of you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This round so we win the uh, excruciating. Yeah, we, <laughs> we, we can blame Stu for this, but let's see what happens. So we, uh, we win the trick, but we have to give the winning card to the other team. That's the weird mm. core mechanic of spoils. So they get two points. Then we get uh, the three-point card. Um, so I believe we've lost no matter what, if you do the math. But let's play this out. Um, so everyone has to play their last card. The lead suit is fish. It's also the sweeper suit. And we don't even have the highest yeah. fish. So they're probably insult to injury. They're probably going to win this final trick. So currently we're winning with six of fish. Oh, Stu. <laughs> Stu giving even more points. So we get the worthless uh, six. They score the rest of the 17 points, and we get thoroughly walloped. Ah. Yeah, by double. But wow. the match is not over, because we play three rounds. So we're accounting for, okay, you can lose a round, but we'll be cumulative points over three rounds. So we can yeah. still- We have some catching up to do, but it is doable. So let's let's try to play these next two rounds a little faster, because um, then we there's this is the very basic version of the game, and we've got some uh, core rules that we introduce in later chapters that we'll show. So this is this is only like you have not even seen our final form yet of, of spoils. Okay. Ooh, Ooh do one of you want to explain way. this this symbol in the middle? Yeah, the so that symbol that's sort of been hanging out in the middle of the screen uh, that we didn't explain earlier um, is the indicator for what the sweeper suit is this round. Um, and um, in later iterations of the game, um, something determines that, but right now it's just chosen randomly. Um, and what the little white X in the center of the screen means is that this round there is no sweeper. So think about all of the sort of fallout of uh, last round, us having um, uh, three of the sweepers, the grumpy patron having the rest of the sweepers. Um, none of that will be in play this, this round because uh, there is no sort of elevated suit. So we'll see how that plays out. Um, it's really only going to be the lead suit that matters now. There's no yeah, sweeper suit yeah. to, to complicate. So um, it's Stu's turn first. 
Uh, very pretty strong first play, I think. So the lead suit is fish. You got to play fish if you have one. And this is perfect. Um, we know the king's going to win no matter what, right? Because there's nothing higher than a king in a suit. There's not even a sweeper suit um, to come in. So we can be very confident in feeding 11 points. So the other team gets the king worth zero points. We get the other three cards totaling to 13 points. Strong start. Um, mm -hmm. It's Stu's turn. Not sure what to do here. Um, Ooh. Leads with the queen. Ooh. Gotta play a star if you have one. So we know the other team's now gonna win. Yeah, so that's a shame. Mm. We had that jack ready to ready to throw in there. Yeah. Uh, mm. If that not second place, but. Uh. So, uh, yep, we get it, Stu. We know we we gotta make a move. Um, so. We could play two points is the is the fewest points three, but a ten is a higher card that could maybe be more likely to win us a later trick. Mm. So there's a little bit of a tricky trade off here. What do you reckon? Should we give him the three or the? I the think ten? the three. Okay. What do you think, Daria? Yeah, I agree. Okay. We're giving one more point in the hopes that the ten might be a high enough card to win us a later trick. Um, oh boy. Ooh. So, uh, that's a good display of teamwork. Unfortunately, it wasn't <laughs> on our side, so we're gonna lose a lot of points here. Um, okay, so we get the worthless king, and they score 10 plus three points. Tied up. Barfly leads with fish with a seven. We only have one option, so the decision's been made for us. And hopefully Stu will. Ooh, very interesting. So the grumpy patron does something very risky, is trying to feed 11 points to the currently winning player. I reckon pretty foolhardy, because it's somewhat likely that, Stu, in, unless the grumpy patron knows that they have a lot of high fish, um, a chance that Stu has a higher fish card that will win this trick. Mm. No. Oh no. Brutal. Okay. What so that also tells us is that the Grumpy Patron is out of fish. Yeah. So, I don't know, so are we. Nice. Yeah. So um, are we. So uh, we get their use of seven and they score the rest of the cards for another 14 points. Yikes. Okay, uh, we must play fish. We don't have fish. In a lot of games of spoils, this would be great because this would be an opportunity for us to break the lead suit, play a sweeper suit. Uh, but this is a game randomly determined. There was a no sweeper game. So um, let's uh, huh. just give them the, the fewest points possible. I don't know. Why don't we just play the six? Is that right? They don't have any fish either. Oh, Stu. Um, feeds Ooh. them. Maybe, maybe Stu had no choice. Um, but somehow, uh, the Barfly manages to win the trick with, the, with two, the two, which yeah. which is wild. Um, yeah. I, I, mm, we'll see if, if does Stu actually uh, is out of um, fish or not. We'll see. Okay, so we get two points. Okay, I guess it's better than nothing. But then they get another 14 points. Or 13 points, sorry, which which hurts. Okay. Did someone play the King of Shells already? Mm, I, I don't remember. I, I also don't remember. Um I don't I don't, don't, I don't think so. Huh. And if not. It's a uh, passive aggressive. <laughs> why don't Why don't we play the? Uh, it, uh, I'm tempted to take to risk it and just play the queen. What do you think? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Yeah. No. Okay. It's, uh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we we should have saved the queen. I mean, it was possible that Stu had the had the king, but um, yeah. Well, we got we got hustled into that bad decision by that NPC telling us to hurry up. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um. Luckily, neither Stu nor us, at least we didn't give up points. It's not great that we played the queen because the queen might have been able to win, the, especially in a no sweeper suit game. 
Uh, it, it's probably bad of us to, to give away the, the queen there. Okay, well. Not many points transfers hands Anyone's here. Anyone's points. It could be worse. Yeah. Ooh. So, clearly we gotta give... It's a bummer. No, oh boy. This it, actually, it's bad no matter what. <laughs> it's a cursed decision. Um, yeah. And th this is what happens in a no sweep pursuit game. We play the jack, they'll get 11 points. I th okay, our only hope is that we can throw away the jack when we break suit later. So let's let's play the queen. Um, yeah. Because because now the queen and the king are gone, so the jack would be the highest suit if we have to ever play anchors. Yeah. That would be bad because yeah. the winning card goes to the other team. The jacks are very dangerous. A lot of the strategy of this game centers around the jack. So anyway, none of these cards are worth any points. Gotta play a shell if you have one. Ugh. And oh. so they win with a five. We, me and Stu, must have pretty low cards. Um, so they get yeah. seventeen I... points. Oh boy, this is not working out well for us. Um, <laughs> Star, you gotta play one if you have one. And again, just having these jacks is really cursed. Um, let's just give away the fewest points possible. Wait, but no, Stu is winning. No. That's uh. what I get for playing too quickly. Uh, <laughs> right. Because now the 10... My, my bad. The, the 10 is now the, <laughs> the highest star at the table. And we give them two points that we didn't uh. um, need to give them. Uh, I wasn't paying attention. We'll get two points back, but... No, 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 no. It was still the best move, because if we had played the jack, then that would have gone... No, but we could have no, played, played the four. Oh, we could have played the four. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's bad. Oh, you live and you learn. <laughs> I didn't see the four. Um, playing either jack is basically giving the team points. Yeah. I think we kind of have to play the four. Yeah. I mean, we're still giving four points... Yeah, well, Stu is also giving four points, so they get eight points. This is really uh, spiraled out of control here. Uh, yeah, this is yeah. Um, oh no! Oh, so at no. least we won't win the trick with the jack, but we have to give away a jack. Have to give um, it away. Yeah. And I believe we saw that Stu didn't have any stars. Is that right? So we'll give away. Oh. Uh, that, that might have been the wrong play. I can't remember, but um. they get oh boy uh, well okay this has turned out interestingly we'll give them 11 points which is bad because like like we worried about we're gonna have the highest anchor but at least we'll get we'll win the other ones the two the ten the two so we get a few points at the end here but we get even uh beat even more badly than the last round um oh. Do you want to explain why this particular round would actually be pretty good for us if we were playing a little bit later on in the game? Well, let's let's get there because we're gonna we're gonna play with the full rules after this next round. Um, actually, should we, in the interest of time, uh, so I right now if we, if we okay, so you always play three rounds, um, but are, is we are behind by what a hundred and eight points is that right there is a mm. chance we could win this game we would have to because there's 128 points in each round we would have to beat them by over 108 points in the third round so it's it's not out of reach but would be difficult right we'd have to get cool. like very lucky cards um should, so maybe in the interest of time maybe we are. Uh, Ooh, should we concede and then uh, go to the next version? Is, or is yeah, that okay. are we cowards for doing that? <laughs> yeah, let's be cowards. Um, okay, let's <laughs> show the rest of the game. Um, so so much to talk about here, right? The inspirations behind this, the implementation, the AI of the NPCs. We'll get to some of that, but we haven't even shown you the full game, and it's worth talking about. There are other rules that I think are important. Um, so let's. 
Let's leave. Um, sorry. We are going to... And there's some... There's some debug settings here because we're playing in a debug build. So don't, don't, don't pay attention to those. Uh, mm -hmm. We're going to leave the card game. So it may, may be very rude of us, but... Um, okay, so let's, let's quit. Exit to the main menu. So that was story mode, where you're playing and exploring these islands uh, and playing through the story of Salt Sea Chronicles. But also from the main menu, we can uh, access the card game directly. Um, so let's uh, play the regular full version of Spoils. Okay, and there's two major kind of features or rules we're, we're adding. Um, and uh, We'll talk maybe a little, we'll first explain what they are and talk a little bit about why this game kind of needs these additional features. So, um, deal out the random cards. Now there's a bidding phase. Um, do uh, Daria or Ben, do one of you want to talk about bidding? Yeah. Um, so, what we saw in the previous rounds um, was that the sweeper suit was just randomly determined. Um, but what, um, what we do in in sort of once you've learned the full rules, we introduce this concept of bidding for the sweeper suit. So that actually gives you a little bit of input because you get to see what your hand is and maybe have a influence in deciding on the suit that would be best for you based on what you have the most of. For example, we have a heck of a lot of stars, uh, mm. so it'd be really convenient for us if we had the stars be the we pursued so um yeah we're gonna um essentially bid for uh what would be the most advantageous for us so we go first um we're right now controlling neshko who's another character in um, your group and now our partner is merle who we were controlling in that last match that you just saw um Oh, wait, no, sorry. I, I'm not, that's wrong. Merle goes first. Isn't that right? Yeah. So Merle's going to go. Now, this mechanic of bidding. So we're not playing the game yet. We are playing a mini game before the game to decide on the sweet pursuit. This is a pretty common mechanic in a lot of trick taking games. If you've ever played 500 or Bridge, some games have very complicated uh, bidding mini games. Like um, in Bridge, for example, famously, the bidding is like a very, very important part of, of Bridge. Um, in this game, it's relatively simple. Um, Sorry, do you want to explain the math of this? So what what is that what uh, the what's that saying in the middle of the screen? Um, yeah, so the whole point of the bidding phase is that each player gets to play one card and it, it goes clockwise as usual, but the whole bidding phase ends after everyone has played one card. So now Merle has started and uh, he has played um, the Jack of Anchors. What he's trying to say is that he is actually bidding 11 points for the anchor suit. So in, in the bidding phase, what's actually important is the amount of points that the card is, um, uh, what that the card's value. So it's not the rank actually, it's only what the point value is. What is actually very important to know is that this through this bidding phase, what you can actually also find out is at least one of the cards of the other players, because now Merle has bid the Jack of Anchors, we know that our partner has a Jack of Anchors in their hand. So that is also very useful information we can get from the bidding phase. Um, yeah, so we're... Uh, you first, Ben. The thing we're looking at here as well is, is that um, symbol in the middle of the screen with the 11, so it's saying that the current high bid is 11 for the anchors. Um, and any of the rest of the plus, see, here it is. Um, uh, what Iris has done now is just throw in another two points for the anchors. So now it says 13. So it's uh, Merle's 11 plus Iris's two, which equals to the 13. So currently, um, Anchors is the high bid, and if another suit ha um, is to topple that, it has to. There has to be sort of more than thirteen points of that suit on the table by the end of this bidding session. 
Um, so this is kind of terrible for us and is uh, a strange situation, right? So essentially, Merle saying, I have good anchor cards. I would love the sweeper suit to be anchors. But weirdly, one of our opponents, Iris, is also saying, yes, anchors. Boy, would I love anchors. Um, there's no card worth 13 or more points individually, right? Jack is the card that's worth the most points. So by ourselves, we cannot outbid anchors. That's terrible because we have one anchor card and it's not very, it's not, yeah. a, not a high rank. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and like we were saying earlier, a bidding is an interesting mechanic in trick-taking games because one, you're, you're do, it's almost this kind of like a wordless signaling game with your partner kind of telling each other, hey, here's what I have. Um, so that's gonna, that knowledge is gonna affect the actual gameplay. And then also, um, as Daria said, we now know, cause we're not playing this card, we're gonna get it back. We're just kind of like showing a peek at this card. So now we know a little bit of information going into the round, who might be uh, strong in what suit, uh, you know, a, a card that each person has. So this, this is part of the reason why bidding is a big, big, uh, common mechanic in a lot of trick taking games. Okay, I reckon we're kind of screwed, but maybe we just play the Jack we, hoping we hope. that... Hoping that it's also a good idea for Stu. Yeah, maybe Stu also plays a Dar... Um, because we don't have any other good... The only other good choice is maybe Fish, but we really only have three Fish cards. I'm, let's just... Okay, let's play... <gasps> oh, interesting. Whoa. Whoa. Um, it's and, okay. Well, boy, do one of you uh, something very it's weird very just happened? Rare that this happened. I, uh, I can uh, maybe try to explain a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, what's actually very important to see in bidding, um, as also Doug mentioned, is that when you bid, the points do not add up by team. So the fact that both Merle and Iris uh, bid for anchors, those points were accumulated even though they are not in the same team. So it's the same thing that happened for Neshko and Stu, even though, again, they are not in the same team. It, usually, you would hope that you and your partner are aligned in kind of what the cards are. So, for example, if Merle bid for anchors and maybe anchors was not our strongest suit but we had still a lot of cards we could have still bid for that because together we had a good amount of cards right but in this case it seems that the two teams were not as aligned so iris and merle both had good anchors and then what we did through our bid we single we we showed that we actually have a lot of stars because we bid so much for the stars. So maybe what you thought in that moment was that, okay, what if we actually equal the bid and then no one gets the advantage of that sweeper suit since none of the team seems to kind of align. So that's kind that's of how I see this strategy playing out. That's what happens in a in a tie, by the way. It's, it's yes. when there's no clear winner, there are no sweepers for the round. So, so yeah, we, this is true in trick taking order matters hugely and sometimes yeah. it's good to go earlier in the order because you kind of like set the conversation sometimes it's a huge advantage to go last in the order because you have all the information so it we don't really know it's like hard to read into what Stu who went forth so Stu was our partner in the last match is now uh, uh one of our opponents um so does Stu actually have good stars or did Stu just see ah, I can um, manipulate the math. Because maybe, maybe Stu is like, whoa, Anchors is winning. Anchors is not on for me. Uh, yeah. I can't beat 13 points. But if I add two um, to Neshko's already 11, I can cancel any sweeper. And maybe for Stu, that's preferable than having Anchors be this. So it's a little hard. I feel like we have more information about... Um, Iris and Merle than we do Stu. So there's maybe maybe some strategic Yeah, uh, maybe here. Merle was sitting on six anchors and it would have been better for us to just uh, Possible. Eat it and just yeah. it's possible. Anchors. 
we'll but that's kind of what's very interesting about the bidding phase is that it it's a lot about trying to figure out what you and your partner have with like these very small signals because you're only allowed to play one card so it's kind of your first also insight on what each yeah. player has in their hand as well so let's there's, there's one other rule we haven't told you about but let's let's play this out a few rounds before we talk about the final rule so um yeah. okay th there's no sweeper suit which like often vastly simplifies the playing of the game um so we only have one uh one shell yeah, okay. this is probably good for us it's called short in in a trick taking game is often called shorting yourself um because next time someone plays shell we now can play anything we want um so we, we might see that and that's often very powerful because that gives you over, more control like for example if we want to feed merle points that maybe merle plays the queen of shells next so we'll see that uh no okay so um Stu had the queen of shells so merle wins we only get two points it's such a low scoring trick yeah very yeah. exciting M merle's a very uh analytical guy yes. um yeah. Okay. We knew Merle had strong anchors. Again, uh, we don't have much of it. We had a very skewed hand. A pretty uh, probability of it happening, but I think relatively low. So we're now out of both anchors and shells. But uh, it's actually interesting from what you can see from this drink is that you can understand why Merle bid so high for anchors. It's because he yeah. had the, the king. So. Okay, yeah, the king not... and the jack at least. Yeah, exactly. Not too much going on. We get five points, but still a lot of points to go. Okay, so we know we're gonna lose this trick no matter what. So we should just give a worthless card. Okay, they get five points. We're still the big guns have not come out yet. And this is very this is often very true of early uh tricks in in a the game of spoils, everyone's kind of waiting for that perfect time to play the higher pointed cards. So, Iris leads. Um, did we already play the, I don't think anyone's played the King of Fish yet, is no. that right? No. So, possibility one, Iris has the King and knows that they can play the Queen and no one can beat it. Possibility two, Merle has the king. Possibility three, Stu has the king. Uh, I reckon pretty risky to rely on our partner having the king, so we might as well play conservative and play a zero-pointed card. Did the two of you agree? Yeah. Mm. Okay. And we don't know who has the king yet. I, I wonder if that means that Iris actually has the king, um, but gets they get three points. <laughs> Yeah, I Still... think Iris or Stu has the king, because mm. like, Stu wouldn't be motivated to play it in that situation. Oops, let me turn off my alarm. Okay. Um, right. So this would have been interesting in a game with a sweeper suit, because we have no shells, and we could have surprised and uh, possibly won this trick with a sweeper card. Uh... There are no sweepers in this game. So... Uh, the question is, do we think Merle, because Merle could have the highest shell, in which case we would want to feed Merle. Um, a lot of points. Seems risky, right? Yeah. So should we, should we just play a no pointed card, you reckon? Yeah, maybe it's good to keep it safe for now. Okay. Ooh. Okay, so that was the right call. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm surprised that this early on seven was the winning card. That's pretty low ranked card to win the trick, but they get 13 points. It's not great. Those aces are worth a lot of points. Oh. <laughs> I, I, the the fat. I. It doesn't seem like Merle has high shells. I think we just need to yeah. play no points again. Oh, Merle. Mm. Um, well, he did, but I, not the one that we wanted. <laughs> so, pr 
pretty bad. Uh, I see. I I now see why though Merle was holding off on playing the the Jack, right? Because Merle didn't want to. I, I suspect that that means that that's Merle's last remaining shell card, right? Um, so that's an interesting strategy in this game too. You can deliberately not play your king and queen if you're holding on to them to try to force someone to kind of win a trick with the Jack, right? So the 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 mechanic of this game leads to this kind of emergent strategy, All right? So they get eleven points. You get four. It's not great. Merle gets to lead. Oh. I think we played the queen of anchors already. So Merle is going to win this, which is. But I wonder maybe um, because, okay, so it's quite late game right now. The difference is not that big, but maybe we can talk about um, the last rule that we haven't spoiled, which is for the. Uh a uh, good okay um so as we've been playing so far you just want as much as many points as possible uh but benadari can you tell us about the hoarding rule that's kind of haunting this game yeah so yeah as doug said the main point of the game is to get as many points as possible but there is a threshold that you do not want to cross so we have a rule in Spoils that's called the hoarding rule, which means that if your team uh, gets over 100 points in one round, then you actually lose the round and the opponent team gets the 100 points. And why is that? It's because this rule echoes a lot of the values that you can find um, in the Salty Chronicles world in which uh, hoarding is viewed uh, negatively um, and people encourage um, that communities uh, split resources between them. So it's this idea that you want to win but not win by the, all of the points so you're not hoarding all of the points. Um, yeah. Sort of mechanics wise it's, it's a um strategy that allows you to still win with bad cards basically um it's yeah. something that you can you can you know you start the beginning of a round and you you just have bad cards it's it's a way of um giving you options so that you're not just sort of you know you haven't just lost from the outset yeah as yeah so Darian... it can be um a strategy that if you see that you have a bad hand and your opponent is doesn't seem to have good enough cards to, to support you as a partner, what you can do actually is try to give as many points to the opponent so that they cross the 100 threshold and you get the 100 points instead. Yeah, so the jack becomes very powerful if you're now trying to throw the game because that's an easy way, possibly, of giving a lot of points to their team. Um, so as Darian and Ben are talking about, we'll, we'll get into this more, right? But So there's this double reason for this hoarding rule. There's like the kind of cultural politics of the fictional world that this game is trying to almost echo. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. The very uh, the very mechanic of this game as well, I think, is, is kind of about the, the values of this fictional world, how that's reflected in the games that are made in this fictional world. But then there's also this mechanical effect of this, um, which is really to balance for randomness. Um, and so we can talk about some of our inspirations. Um, there are famously, there are like all, what we might call an alternative win condition. Um, but let, let, let's talk about our influences in a little bit. Because first, because of this hoarding rule, we have, I think, a major departure point now. So the, the game is, I think, getting away from us a little bit, right? So I think we're at the point where we're like, do we just try to minimize our losses and get as many points as possible? Or do we think we can push them over 100 points, in which case we want to give the other team points? Um, I think this is close. Let's think about it. We have 11 points already. There's 128 yeah. points for grabs. So we could only afford to win maximum 17 more points. Otherwise, we can't bait them into hoarding. Um, yeah, what's actually very interesting about hoarding is also that in a game of suppose you, you wouldn't want to explicitly tell your partner, hey, let's try to throw the game. 
So you actually maybe want to try to figure out through playing your cards on, hey, should yeah. we throw this game? So this right. is why I wanted to to bring up this point now because maybe is Moral trying to say, hey, can you win this round or should we actually right. start throwing our points? Right. So this this is and this is the feeling of playing bridge as well, right? This kind of wordless communication through the cards themselves. Yeah. What's what's up with Merle's play? Is it this is my only anchor card left? Oh well, or is Merle like a wink, like oh maybe we should go for hoarding, just for mm. fun? I, I, actually, the fact that we control so many points, we have two aces and a jack left, and we're short two suits. We have a lot of control to feed high pointed cards. It actually may be worth it for us to try to go for hoarding. So just for funsies, why don't, should we try to go for hoarding? Yeah, let's do it. So that that means we actually want to give as few points away this turn. So let's let's give away the two, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. So we can play whatever we want because we don't have any anchors. Because, because Merle is probably going to win this trick because I think we've played the queen and the king of anchors already. So we don't want to win points because we're going to, we, we want to give all the points to the other team. So let's let's minimize the amount of points that, that we're giving to ourselves. We'll play the two. Ooh. Interesting. I don't know if the king means that they know that hoarding is a risk here. That, that's quite interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, anyway, they get 11 points. We get two points. We're all in now. We're all in on hoarding. We've kind of made that choice. So. Ooh. Not great. And, yeah. Should we re pivot? <laughs> <laughs> it might be the. Because we're definitely going to. I mean, oh, we're boy. most likely going to ring this round. We. We could give four points, but we're going to win 10 points, which would put us at. No, no, no. If we play the four, we would get at least. 14 points, so it put us at 27. We're already it's, done, yeah. <laughs> well, unless unless something incredibly magic happened and we basically won no more points. Um, so we we made the wrong call, I think. We're gonna have to re-pivot now. Yeah. Um, so let's just try to feed Merle as many points as possible. Let's let's feed Merle, I don't know, this ace, maybe? Or maybe the jack, so we jack, can yeah. accidentally give it to the... Okay, yeah, good point, right. We have to be concerned about winning with the jack, so let's yeah. do that. So we catch up a bunch because we win yeah. a lot of points. So we piv we we pivoted to losing and we repivoted to trying to win <laughs> again. That's that's what spoils is like, right? Yeah. Um weird situation. Um does do remember Iris and Merle were the people who bid anchors. Iris doesn't have any anchors left. I wait. I reckon we take a risk and assume that Stu has no more anchors. Uh, wasn't what was the lead suit of the previous round? Wasn't it also anchors? Do I remember wrong? No, it was because uh, Merle won with the queen of anchors, and Stu didn't play an anchor card. If, I, if my memory says this is why you need a memory. Yeah, like I, yeah, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not registering yeah. the, the. Okay, so let's let's I don't know. Let's play um the ace, I guess. Question yeah. about which eights. Um, should we short ourselves this card? Um, I can't tell. Let's play this ace. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that was good. We give them four points, but that the ace mm. was the correct play for us. We get 14 points. Take the lead. Ooh. Mm. Yep. Close margin. Iris is correct. Okay, so we can continue to feed. This is the benefit of having, being so long in a suit is the trick-taking term for it. Because now, as long as Merle get could keep get the lead in in a game with no sweepers, kind of Merle can keep winning these tricks. So we can, I think, safely feed Ace. Great, we get ten points, and I think we're pulling away with this. Look at that, our first yeah. lead. Yeah, so Merle's mm. strong anchors won us the game. Yeah. Wow, we really pull away with it at the end. And very funny, we were trying to, there was one turn where we were trying to lose the game. Uh, yeah. That yeah. 
That would have been a disaster. That would have been tragic. That's amazing. Um, so why don't we let, let's let's play round two and three. So we're we're winning right now, but there's there's two more rounds as we play kind of ambiently. So there's these the that hoarding rule brought up these two interesting conversations. One, the kind of cultural politics of this world, like like why spoils, why these mechanics, what that's trying to do on a storytelling level about the fiction of the game, and then maybe some of our inspirations about why these mechanics, like like why these this hoarding. Um, Ben, as I like look, um, as I pilot this and slowly play the second round, um, the original mechanic, this idea is when we when we were originally brainstorming uh, uh, this idea for what kind of trick taking game could we make? Um, can you talk about because because that was your idea, this idea of giving the winning card, uh, this kind of like strange counterintuitive mind bending mechanic? Um, wh- why that mechanic? Yeah, um, I mean it's it's sort of we wanted something that would sort of reflect the world that the game is situated in. Um, you know, um, Salty Chronicles takes place in a sort of post-flood world where people have rebuilt on sort of the uh, sort of notion of collectivism and sharing and not repeating the mistakes of the past of of um, hoarding and building up and greed, and so it felt like a um, it felt like an interesting thing to reflect that in the sort of core rule of the game. And so this prospect of well, when you win the trick, you don't keep the winning card; you share it with your opponents, um, and that being the sort of primary, um, you know. Um, mechanic, um, yeah, it just seemed neat, and it seemed like it reflected the, the sort of um, the world. And we do that in other places as well. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about um, how each um, community in in the archipelago plays boils in their own way. Um, mm. but yeah, that's that's sort of where the main mechanic came from. And I I think that's important, right? Because it's one. In fact, the core mechanic was inspired by the fiction about the world building. So that that was like, I think, a really rewarding process for us to let the fiction kind of inspire some of the mechanics. Um, and then, right, so this isn't just a mini game. So so what, why is there a card game in this story game? I think the, the notion was, well, you're spending a lot of this game like having conversations reading Let's give a different modality of playing, a different way of activating your brain to kind of break up the action of this game. Um, and but it, this can do more work than just being a fun mini game, right? Because we know it from the real world, games kind of reflect the cultural context, the kind of the history of the, the place that the game is made, right? So, um, well, what if a you're playing a real game, but it is a fictional game in this world? Well, certainly the game that has like evolved in this world tells us something about the people who play it. So that's at least the kind of the idea behind um, some of those mechanics. All right, we led, uh, we kind of bid high for anchors because we're pretty long in anchors. Um, we don't have a king though, so let's just start play a nothing card. Actually, I blew that. I should have shorted ourselves with the three because we want to be able to sweep her in later. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, okay, not a great start for us. Also, just the sort of, the other, you know, I feel like all of our decisions have sort of two reasons to them, but the other reason behind, like, wanting to introduce, like, um, um, uh, house rules to every, you know, to, to different places as you, as you explore, you find different ways to play. Um, partly that's like, you know, it, it, it's reflective of the culture of that place or the story that's happening in that place. But partly it's also, we wanted to introduce a bit of sort of surprise to the player when they, you know, enter a new place and they, they come back to do this familiar thing of playing the card game. It's nice to, uh, have that be a new experience each time, um, whether that's like you know, there's some sort of challenge they have to do, or 
oh, the rules are just completely different. You have to think about the game differently um, when while you're here. Um, yeah, it's so. It's... We'll, we'll get to that. I reckon after these three rounds, let's show some of those, um, the variations of what we're calling the house rules on these different islands. Um, as I play this, we're, we're looking for, we've just shorted ourselves of fish. We're, we're going to hope that the sweet pursuit comes in. Um, did someone play the king of anchors yet? I should be paying attention. I think they did. <laughs> no, oh, I wasn't paying attention. Oh, no one had played the anchors, and in fact, our opponents have it. This is this is what we get for having a conversation as we play this game. Um, well, okay, so let's 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 show this rule. Um, this is actually perfect. Uh, I don't know if Merle meant to do this, but um, watch so the lead suits fish. Merle's winning. That's not great because. Uh, Jack will give 11 points as a winning card to the other team. We don't have any uh, fish. So we can play whatever we want. We could play the sweeper suit. So we could win this trick no matter what. Let's play a zero point card. We win the trick because it's the sweeper suit. And we're going to get the Jack and these twos. We, 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 uh, I don't know if Merle was trying to feed, if wanted to go for hoarding or what, but let's try to get points. Um, so that's the, that's the power of the sweeper suit. Um, that's also the power of the strategy of this game is actually to to force yourself to be out of the suit is often very powerful. Um, I don't know. I think someone played the king of shells. I should be paying attention. Great. The yeah. jack. Um, as I play out the rest of this round, uh, so let's we can talk about some of the card game inspirations. Like I know for all three of us, there was a lot of we we spent a lot of time researching trick taking games, playing trick taking games. Let's talk about that a little bit. But Daria, can you tell us a little bit about, um, so obviously a huge part of the development um, for you as like the lead programmer among other roles on Spoils. Uh, this is a multiplayer game in a single player video game. So uh, to tell us a little bit about the AI of these other three NPCs that we're playing with. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think Trying to figure out how we can uh, best control the the MP uh, the other players in Spoils was a very interesting challenge. Mostly because to start with, Spoils is a card game. So unlike a lot of other board games, when you just look at the current table, you do not always have all the information of what is in the game right now. So what is the missing variable? It's always going to be the hands of the other players. So you don't know what the other players have in in their hand. And we kind of wanted also to mimic that through our AI. So instead of giving it all of the information, we actually kept this unknown variable. So the other players also don't know what, what you have in your hand or what your partner has uh, and so on, which I think um, was very important for us to kind of keep this um, way of trying to mirror how humans would actually play this game. So so you're so, saying the AI is not cheating. Like the AI no. literally doesn't know what the yeah. opponents have. Yeah. Exactly. Or, or even what so your it, partner has. Yeah. Yeah. It knows just as much as you do. Um so it also has the information of the cards that have been played, which you also have, but it doesn't know what what the other players have in their hand. So that's kind of the first thing. The other the the second thing that um, we needed to look at in terms of AI is that this is not a, a fully adversarial game. So it's not you playing against three other players. It's two players playing against two other players. So you have this cooperative um, thing that has to happen between you and your partner that you have to work together. and But you're still working together against to other opponents so it was a lot about trying to figure out how can the ai convey this team feeling to to you and it's the same cooperative um feeling that the opponents have so it's not just you and your partner but also the opponents between themselves um so yeah it it was 
um, it, it is a lot about this cooperative part. And then again, it, it, then it goes to, you know, the adversarial part in which you are trying to um, play the best card against your opponent. Um, so that's kind of on the surface level how the AI operates. Another important part of, that we wanted to convey through our AI is that this, the other players are not perfect. They're not here to destroy you. They're here to play spoils as, as, as much as humans are. So they can also make mistakes um, or also just uh, try to make decisions based in the moment that are maybe not perfect, but in with as much information that they have may be the best in that situation. Um, so yeah, that's that's why it's important that they do not have more information at you like, more than you. So they don't know what the future is going to be. They only know what is on the table, what are the cards that have been played, um, and so on. So they, yeah, Adam, it, I had a yeah. I um, realized I didn't know the answer to this. Do they remember who played what in terms of like? You know, it, the the thing that we're doing at the table right now of sort of, oh, did does anybody remember if somebody played the the king of uh, of that? Like, are they also doing that where they have a little sort of memory of of somebody played this before, so it's not going to come again? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they yeah, they also do have this memory, but yeah, as I said, that's as much as they do. So I think that's actually something that's very good that we didn't let it just cheat and let it destroy you because the point of you playing spoils in in the story in the story especially when you just beat the locals you probably don't always want to win you just want to have a casual um game of cards <laughs> so jerry can i ask so there's some kind of like the principles of how the ai should work mm -hmm. but but how do you even go about coding some kind of complex AI, both for the partner and the opponents? Like, is it just like a million manual if statements? Uh, no, you're using uh, machine yeah. learning. Is that right? Can you talk very yeah. briefly about, yeah. Um, yeah, so in more technical terms, we are using um, deep reinforcement learning. So kind of how that works is that the, the AI plays the game a bunch of times. And for example, um, let's say that the AI played a king and it it won the trick, so it gave zero points to the opponent. That is a good move in, that is what is considered a good play. So we tell the AI, okay, that's good that you did that. And then the AI learns, okay, then that's a good strategy given the circumstances that I have right now. So if the circumstances are similar, then I'm going to try to do a similar strategy. So it's not a bunch of if, if statements. And well, the reason for that is that there is, it's probably impossible for us to figure yeah. out the yeah. amount of combinations and strategies that you can have in spoils. And it's also kind of taking away the bias of what we think are good strategies. Um, so it might be that the AI finds some strategies that can win the game that you haven't thought of. So you can also learn from it just as it has learned <laughs> itself. So that yeah. I think is what is very beautiful about taking away, as I said, that bias of what what is actually a good strategy. In the end, a good strategy is what gives you the most amount of points and what wins you the game in the end, right? So. What is also very important about how the AI operates is that it's kind of looking at the big picture. So it's not just figuring out what's the best strategy in the current trick, but in the long game as well. So for example, let's say like um, you have a king, uh, both the king and the queen of the same suit as it happened uh, and Doug mentioned. So you know that if you uh played the queen no one can beat you because you're the one that has the king no one else has it so this is also something that the ai is thinking about oh i can play the queen now win this trick and just play the king later and win the trick the, the next trick or a future trick um or maybe i play this card and i figure out oh okay um 
it seems that this player has run out of anchor, so maybe I can um, win with an anchor later, or so on, yeah, whatever strategy you're thinking of. So it's always thinking of the entire round, of, like, if I play this now, could it affect me in a few rounds as well? The way and... that I uh, sort of think about this process of, like, you know, machine learning is, is like, you're letting it practice, basically, like, on a, you know, massive scale. You're, like, giving it the game, the rules of the game to play thousands and thousands and thousands of times so that it, like, and, and also, like, context for, like, you did good and you did bad, um, so that it basically develops its own context. Um, and, and, you know, when you're playing the game and it has a move to make, it's basically using its past experience of what moves have it made that were similar and how did they go uh, to, to decide on, on what to do this time. Yeah, and this type of machine learning, which is called, as I said, reinforcement learning, is trying to kind of mimic how humans learn. So you know that you have uh, made this play and it was a bad play, you have noticed that in the moment, then you, your brain remembers, okay, next time maybe I should not do that. But it, it is this kind of illusion of intelligence though right yeah. like like we probably even saw in the first game we played it's just like a whole bunch of numbers essentially that it knows so sometimes your partner uh might do something that seems so obviously wrong to us as a human player who can reason but you've just hit some you know unlucky part of their kind of model or sometimes they have such a deep understanding of the game that you're just now miscommunicating like maybe they actually understand wait we have a chance at greedy Sorry, not a greedy at hoarding. Um, uh, uh, getting the other players to be greedy to get over 100 points. But we sometimes, as the human players haven't seen that yet. So um, Sometimes yeah. both of those things happen just when you're playing with humans at a real table. Though. Like, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, either they mess up in your eyes because they didn't see a, an opportunity that you saw or vice versa where they're making a yeah. play that is actually good but you're not picking up yeah. on it. Yeah. Um, okay, lots more to say. We could say more about, right? Because it's pretty interesting challenges, I think, Daria, about in terms of kind of tweaking the AI, stuff we could talk about with the inspirations of some of the mechanics, other card games we looked at. Uh, but why don't we, because, you know, we only have so much time, why don't we uh, play at least one of the variants to talk about these kind of different house rules um, that are in the game, right? So, as you go through the various chapters of the story mode of this game and you uh, uh, kind of explore the archipelago um, in this game, you encounter these different cultures, these different islands. And th you know this is maybe like a euchre or like a bridge, the popular card game, spoils, played in the fictional world of this game. But um, as happens in the real world, right? Uh, games played with common equipment that spread um, through culture, different families, different playgrounds, different countries, different communities modify the game at their own house rules. So we do that in a number of places. Um, do uh, should we should we do inverse spoils maybe, or do you, do you have a favorite variant that you want to start with? I think let's try uh, either dueling sweepers or eruption eights. Yeah. Um, your call, Daria. Dealing sweepers or eruption aids? Uh, maybe let's do dealing sweepers because I think that one has a very interesting rule. So, let's talk about the rules, and then as we play, we can talk about you know the community that this comes from because um, th this is this is almost like a kind of mechanical way of capturing some of the story that's happening in this particular chapter. Okay, so the, the name of the variant is Dueling Sweepers. Now they're going to be not just one sweeper suit, but two. What? Okay, so here are the rules. During bidding, each team bids on their own sweeper suit, separate from the other team. So now no longer are we just our bids adding up across the table. Um, each team is going to have their own sweeper suit. Um, so it's 
possibly likely not necessarily we'll, we'll we'll show that in a second that there will be two different sweeper suits one for each team during play the sweeper suit alternates each trick between the two teams sweeper suits of course if both teams bid for the same suit in fact there will just be one sweeper suit so it's possible that we both unlikely but possible that we both end up having the same sweeper suit uh and the first trick the way this alternation will start is the first trick will start with the sweeper suit chosen by the team um that didn't include the dealer okay so bidding phase let's let's, let's show this um we kind of would love it to be stars right so let's bid yeah, yeah. what why don't should we give our ai a chance to override us because it's not like we have the best stars ever why don't we like tentatively say hey look we, we kind of would love stars but you can override us if you have an even better choice mm. no i think mm. let's oh i was gonna say let's just oh no okay <laughs> okay maybe we'll maybe see. it should have been more we'll see how they yeah. respond yeah so now you there can... see now there's two icons yeah, yeah darian <laughs> no i was about to say the same thing oh okay um whoa merle and our opponents both like anchors merle's cards are worth zero so we are going to have stars this might be a smart way of merle telling us okay cool we'll do stars but just so you know uh mm -hmm. i have this kind of high anchor card in case you want to feed me um mm -hmm. an anchor good to know yeah. um okay I similar that, that was merle's way of it just agreeing with us yeah, sa sa same thing with Iris, right? However, um, you know, we so they're going to have anchors. We know that Merle has a high anchor. That's interesting. Um, OK, so we got two different sweeper suits. That's wild. And we're going to start again, on their sweeper. Yeah. So both sweepers are never active at the same time. It's just going to be a one, one trick. It's anchors the next trick. It'll be stars for us. Okay. Um, they're already playing pretty aggressive in our weeper suit. Uh, we know we're going to lose this, so we're going to play zero point card. Yeah. The zero point trick. He's a little bit mad about it. <laughs> Sweeper suit alternates now. Now, this will probably get more interesting. Uh, as we go, because mo most likely everyone had, it doesn't have to happen this way, but most likely everyone has at least one of each suit. So the sweeper is going to get more interesting later. This is good for us. We'll short ourselves of fish. Yeah, we're out of fish now. So next time somebody leads with the fish, we can play whatever we want. Let's let's. Uh, play this a little bit, and then we can talk a little bit about the story. So, um, why this mechanic? But let's play a few more. Let's 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 wait to see someone break suit. Okay. Uh, great. We can just win this, can't we? So, yeah. Um, perfect. Give them two points, but we get ten points. I wonder if their strategy is to take away all of our stars it seems they're kind of doing yeah that. it seems like it yeah <laughs> um tricky uh well, i don't know play the seven or something let's not give anyway let's not give any points away let's just see what happens here yeah. okay uh boo merle actually had oh, the king no. ah but good oh we interesting picked up a Pick a, picked up a lucky ace. Nice. Um, so sort of without giving too much away about sort of the um, the story of the game, the the variant uh, that we're playing right now comes from a area in the world um, that is sort of defined by two communities living there who are sort of at odds with each other. One community lives on one side and the other lives on the other side. Um, and that's the story of when, when you go and visit that island, um, the story is sort of about navigating that, that rift between the two sets of people. So our rules sort of reflect that. Um, 
with the sort of push and pull of two different sweepers. Um, yeah. I, th I think the inspiration here is once that you're doing house rules, like like we said, okay, well, the mini game can actually do world building itself. Um, so what if we could do um, like a Hamlet, famously in Shakespeare's play Hamlet, right? There's the play within the play. Um, so what if we could do the game within the game? Um, what if this like this particular uh, rule set uh, or version of suppose you're playing recapitulates the story of what's happening in the, in the bigger episode? So that's a little high concept, but as Ben said, that's what's kind of happening here. The dueling sleep, the the tug of war between these two sweet pursuits is kind of the narrative tug of war as the players are kind of pushed and pulled by these two kind of uh, factions at odds with each other. Yeah. Um, oh boy, what should I play here? Uh, unclear. I don't know. Let's just play that. Uh, I could have gone worse. <laughs> Right, I could have actually played a sweeper there. Maybe I should have actually. Um, I, I probably, mi probably missed. Play. We're in. We're in. Are we in danger, or are we? Are we in danger of uh, hoarding? It's technically possible, but they, we only need to give them five more points, and they're yeah, about to get. They're about to get four. Wait. I like. I think. I think we're good. So. We're good. Yeah, we're good. We're officially good now. They're over the limit. Yeah, that is a thing that you have to bear in mind when you're winning. You can't just sort of be happy about winning. You have to be like, am I winning too much? Exactly. Um, exactly. <laughs> so the danger of uh, having everything reversed at the end of the round. So we did almost as well as is possible to do without... Well, okay, we didn't get into the 90s quite, but we still are doing real good there. <laughs> so as we, as we play the next round, maybe a couple things to uh, say. So it's not just custom rules. So there are about like five islands that have these custom house rules. Um, without saying too much, sometimes we give the players a special mission. So you're playing um, regular spoils with no house rules, but we say, you know, maybe purposely lose this game for some uh, kind of story reason. Or, uh, hey, we're purposely gonna give you very unlucky cards see if you can win anyway where that becomes now a metaphor for like overcoming bad odds that have been dealt to you so there's like a number of ways that you'll see through the game both through custom rules and through special situations or special missions um where the puzzle kind of this like puzzle solving feel of playing spoils changes per episode um Dari and Ben, do either of you want to talk about... So obviously, uh, this game was inspired by a lot of research. Um, what were some of the, the, the card games that kind of inspired us? Mm, there's so many. Gosh. Um, the Crew was a, a huge one. Um, I know we spent a lot of time playing um, The Crew by... I forget the name. Like, do, you have, do you have that? Not off the top of my head, but it's a pro pro yeah. pro proprietary... Uh, trick-taking games that's play with a custom deck of cards. Ben, you want to like summarize kind of like what's the, what's the crew? What did we get from the crew? Um, I think for, well, for me at least it was sort of, um, it, it inspired a lot of my, my thinking towards like the theming and the, the sort of like, um, the thing we're doing that you just described of like giving the player a, a little mission basically a little sort of you know objective and and the, the thing they're doing is still playing a, a single card every trick but the thing they're trying to achieve being different each time is something that the crew does really well um and so yeah that, that's that's the thing that maybe uh the rest of you sort of picked up something something else um from that but um yeah i, I really like that about the crew Um, Daria, what sticks out to you in terms of the, the various card games that we played? Is there, is there anything in particular? Um, I think uh, one that I do remember quite a lot is because when, um, when we started, uh, researching and 
figuring well what are what the spoils rules that are. We played a lot of trick taking card games, and I was actually not familiar with most of them. And what uh, I found very interesting is that, for example, in Hearts, but I don't remember exactly what the rule is. There is one rule uh, that is very high risk and um, shooting the moon. Yeah, shooting the moon. Yeah. Uh, that is very high risk, but can actually win you the game. And I think that's that was also one of the inspiration for the hoarding rule, because, yeah, as I said, it's it's a rule that's very high risk, so you can end up actually feeding the opponent a lot of points if the, if you don't actually manage to get to a hundred. But if you do get it to a hundred, then the reward is very significant because you instantly win the round. Yeah. So. Uh... I think uh, definitely Hearts is a huge. So I, I did, did either of you grow up with Hearts? So at least where I grew up in New Jersey, definitely we played Hearts. Where okay, so maybe that's slightly more of a USA thing. Um, so Hearts is this free for all, not team based trick taking game with this alternate win condition. Um, I think the issue with almost any trick taking game, right? If we, if we want to break down the game design, is you have to you have to deal with randomness. The fact that, is it fair if one team just gets, as Ben was saying earlier, bad cards? So how do you deal with bad luck? Well, there's a couple ways that different trick-taking games deal with this. So in a game like Bridge or Spades or 500, it's the bidding phase that deals with it. Because in those games, in the bidding phases, you often also not just bid for what the sweepers, the Trump suit will be, but also sometimes you say, we're gonna bid, we're gonna predict this is how many tricks we're gonna win. And then you get penalized if you fail to win that many or you earn more, points if you do kind of meet your bid so that's a way um, of adjusting um, for randomness right in terms of making one of the teams kind of try to bet on how many tricks they'll win hearts uh this alternate win condition shows another way what if uh there's an alternate win condition where your cards are so bad you can play perfectly badly to then flip that around um which is of course what the the hoarding rule is and spoils i think for me another inspiration uh Behind that is a, a, a two-player trick-taking game called The Fox and the Forest. Uh, it was a commercial Ooh. little card game. That that card game also has a similar thing. They call it Greedy, uh, which is if you win too many tricks, in fact, the points that are earned for the round, your opponent earns a lot of points. So you have to be very careful not to win too many tricks. That means if you have bad cards, maybe you, you try to uh lose a lot of tricks to your opponents to push them into that greedy territory now in that game it's based on the cards don't have a particular value it's based on the number of tricks that you won of course in our game it's 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 not based on the number of tricks you won it's that these individual cards are worth points um for for me that was a, an idea that we picked up uh, there's an italian trick taking game called uh briscata Chiamata, I think, is the name that has this property where all the cards are worth different amount of points. So that, that you know, that was another inspiration um, behind the game. Yeah, we sort of played a whole load of trick-taking games, and and sort of um, it gave us a uh, sort of vocabulary, basically, of like of, of yeah. rules we could sort of. Yeah. use as uh, inspiration and pick from and, and look at what how each of these games handles um, you know, handles things like randomness and, and, and that sort mm. of thing um, um, and so yeah, we've, we've our game and the variants of the game are sort of inspired by a sort of soup of influences um, oh. which which was a really fun, fun process, it was a lot of um mm. We're a remote team, so so there's no way we're sort of getting together at a table and, and playing card games. Um, and so we used a tool that uh, Doug introduced us to called PlayingCards.io, which is a um, it's a card game table that you you just run through a, a browser tab uh, on your computer. Um, and um, yeah, we would we would weekly get in a get in a card game session and, and play a new game. Um, really fun yeah and um, what's i think really great about the way that spoils is built is that as i said it's built from the 52 standard card deck in which you just take out um, some cards so in reality if you have a basic uh, deck of cards at home 
you can just start playing it with your friends. It's just that the suits would be different, but that's not <laughs> um, something that's super important. What the symbol is on the card. So yeah, yeah. We definitely encourage that you just play it out with um, your friends because something that we found that we enjoyed a lot when we were playing um, also as well with other guests just on even just on playing cards.io is that what's great about spoils is also just the banter that you have with the yeah. other players it's something that we tried to uh, convey even a little bit through uh, the players just doing barks uh, throughout the game but yeah. obviously in real life that's just going to feel way much better so we definitely yeah. encourage that you try it out yeah great point yeah the um, other thing that sort of comes into play when you're playing the game um, with real people is is just the effect that uh, the effect of, of knowing the people around you and sort of their temperaments <laughs> and uh, the effect that happens yeah. Yeah. on the game and just knowing that like okay this person is a rash person and so that's probably going to affect how they see the strategy um, that's a really fun element. Um, yeah. yeah, a lot of this research process and the sort of early type prototyping process just sort of reminded me that I really like card games. <laughs> um, it's been yeah. a few years since I properly, mm. like, I don't know, played them, so it was a fun process. Yeah. Well, why don't we, because um, I know I don't want to keep the two of you too long. Why don't we, because we're almost at the end of the third round and then maybe we we can call it there. Let's, uh, it's all tied up. Um, I know we haven't been oh, wow. paying too much attention, so we can't remember what cards have been played. But we're alternating now between No Sweeper, which is pretty interesting. They both bid mm. zero point cards. And for us, um, Star. So I do have two. This Jack is kind of a problem, though, and I'm not sure what to do about it. I think I'm actually going to play it and hope. Okay, I was hoping we get more points out of that, but okay. see. But I'm gonna win with this Jack, which is probably bad. Uh, yeah, that Jack is a bit of a curse this late in the game. Yeah. Uh, boy. Well, I think we're gonna win overall because we won the first round so well. But this, we're hoping. Are we? Oh, it's so close. No, we got we got mm. another Jack, so, so we're good. Nice. So. Yeah, um, that's what I thought might happen. Great. There you go. That's dueling sweepers. And, that was a uh, close one. Yeah, but the overall, because we did so well the first round, which we had a yeah. good margin. Yeah. 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 Um, that spoils. Uh, like we said, it's a trick-taking card game you can play as a part of Salt Sea Chronicles, uh, and you'll, you'll hopefully you'll see some of these other cool house rules you'll see um what it's saying about the culture and the world in the story um so that's how to that's how to play spoils that's why we made spoils uh anything final to add from either of you maybe just like a quick mention that as you keep playing the game and you find out uh and you find these variants across the world uh, you're actually going to be able to keep the knowledge of these variants. So then you can just go back in the main menu and replay them forever. But you yeah. just need to find them first. <laughs> so mm. that's important. Yeah, that's sort of the structure of how we're presenting it. Is that as you play the main the main game, um, you'll sort of find people out in the world who want to play spoils with you. And as you do, you sort of collect those rules so that you can come back to the main menu and just, just play it as a standalone game. Yeah, someone has to teach you the rules first, someone right? Has to teach you the rules, <laughs> yeah. um, well, thank you to the two of you. Um, that spoils. Um, and we'll, we'll link Salt Sea Chronicles um, in, in the description. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, hope, hope you enjoy spoils. <laughs>